Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's another edition here of 153greatfish.website. We're back on the air after a long vacation over the 4th of July, Independence Day here in the United States. Um, the message today is focused on what's going on in our world. We're going to talk about some prophecy today. That's very important. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about how God has woven various bits of prophecy together that end up in the book of Revelation. So we're going to start with some things that will help you to understand uh, the last book of the Bible. So let's begin with prayer. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you, mighty God. We ask you, Lord, to be part of this Bible study. Anoint our minds. And God, I pray, give us ears to hear and give us eyes to see. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin with our PowerPoint as usual. And what we're going to talk about today is the conflagration, the conflagration. And uh, this is kind of a part two of our Revelation series. We've had some other things there. They'll be on our website. So this is Understanding the Book of Revelation 2 of 12. And I've got the part one out there along with some other videos on the website. You should take a look at those when you get time. First off, we want to uh, understand that, that in our outline that there's an introduction to Jesus' coronation prophecy scriptures. Coronation is what Jesus came to Jerusalem for. It was withheld from him by the Aaronite priests. They would not uh, give him inauguration. Then Jesus gave them the, in return, the temple destruction prophecy. And uh, then we're going to talk about Emperor Domitian and the Patmos Island, 95 AD, where John wrote the book of Revelation. This is important to understand why this date of 95 AD is important. And uh, the failed coronation opportunity is going to be presented again to uh, the world. And uh, of course, we're going to have a different set of priests that will inaugurate Jesus at his second coming. We're going to talk about the star of Bethlehem and the star of Pleiades. This is a lesson that I've taught before. Uh, it's on the website today. But we're going to specifically talk about the hen and chicks. And uh, we're going to talk about something new. Peter's conflagration uh, prophecy and the two-stage rapture. And then finally, the conflagration and the day of the Lord. We're going to find out what conflagration means here in just a minute. So let's proceed. The Jewish temple destruction prophecy. Now, these two passages of scripture, Matthew 24, verses 1 through 44, and Luke 21, 5 through 36. This is a weave. This is a weave. It's important to place these scriptures side by side. Now, I have a spreadsheet that does this. If you are interested in having this spreadsheet, please email me at 153FHG at gmail.com and I will send you this spreadsheet. And this puts these two uh, temple prophecies together. This is all about the temple, Jerusalem, and the coronation. And uh, Jesus tells about the temple's destruction and, of course, then the coronation of Jesus at the end time. Now, there's four key questions in these two weave prophecies that really should belong together in uh, a unified outline, which we would call a desiderium. That's what they used to call it. That's a word that simply means I've woven uh, different uh, points of view of the same event together. It's like having two newspaper reports of Noah's flood and weaving them together to get one story. So here's the four questions that the disciples asked Jesus, which he answered while viewing the temple. So it's very, very important to keep these four questions in mind. Number one, they asked him about the temple destruction. When shall these things be? They wanted to know the timing when the temple would be destroyed because Jesus said not, not one stone will be left upon another. That's what he said. The second question they had is what sign will, a lot, will arrive heralding the temple's destruction? They ask sign questions a lot. What sign is going to tell us that the temple will be destroyed? Now, this is a fascinating question. And Jesus answers it. Then they ask him, what sign will arrive prior to your coming to Jerusalem for coronation again? Note, uh, Jesus stated that Jerusalem would not see him until the priests, the Aaronite priests, inaugurated him of, as king of Israel with the phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this comes straight out of Psalm 118. We're going to review that prophecy today or that, uh, that psalm. And uh, Jesus was looking for the temple priests to stand facing each other, crossing their swords. He would walk through this tunnel and they would say, God save the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They refused to give him this, even though the people of Israel cried Hosanna, which is basically the same thing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then finally, the fourth question they asked, what sign will be given 
heralding the end of the age. And I know that some of the translations say end of the world, but it really means the end of the age. That would be the end of the church age. And Jesus is gonna answer these questions in this weave of prophecies. That's why it's important to kind of put them both together and uh, look at it. So the Jewish temple destruction prophecy, that's what we're talking about right now. From the, uh, we're gonna talk about the time period from the temple destruction to the messianic king coronation. That's what those two prophecies are talking about. Here's a highlight of what he said in these uh, prophecies. He says, not one stone shall be left upon another. He says, these are the days of vengeance. That's found in Luke 21. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the world. The abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. He said that would occur. There shall be great tribulation, trouble, such as never has been before. False Christ shall arise. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. The saints will be betrayed by family members and fearful believers. Now, this is the strange thing. If you're a believer and you betray your fellow saint, you're in trouble. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. He says, watch and continuously pray that you, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. And I believe that what this is referring to is that when tribulation comes and people begin to betray one another, you can betray somebody economically over, over money, you can betray them over influence, trying to gain favor from somebody else. Um, there's all kinds of ways to betray our fellow believers. We just want to be accounted worthy to escape. So make sure you don't betray anyone. Make sure you remain faithful to Jesus Christ. Make sure you endure persecution. Can you say praise the Lord? Okay, so that's basically the uh, temple destruction prophecy through the uh, coronation of Jesus. He comes a second time for coronation. Now, why is Domitian and the island of Patmos important in 95 AD? What, why are these three things important? So let's begin to look at that. Domitian was the Roman emperor when John was uh, exiled to Patmos, and he's depicted on Roman coins as a god holding six or seven stars, normally seven, in his hands, He's sitting on a globe, okay, on these coins. By the way, they didn't believe in a flat earth back then. He's sitting on a globe, that's the world, and he's holding a thunderbolt, broadcasting his epithet, which is in Roman and Latin, master, which is despotus, where we get the word despo, and divine Caesar, or Jupiter, or God. That was the key god of the Roman pantheon. That's Domitian. So Domitian reigned from about 84 to 95 or so, 96. Domitian deported criminals to penal colonies. And of course, the best colonies they had was like Australia and Aegean Island, an island. They deport criminals to the islands. They couldn't get off it. And they were considered enemies of the state. John was deported to Patmos. He was given the revelation of Jesus in a series of visions, which he was told to write them down for the post-apostolic church. He did not write these visions down, the book of Revelation, to the Jewish church in Jerusalem. He wrote them to the seven churches of Asia. And in this uh, revelation, it shows this post-apostolic church, the signposts of history in advance, spanning the age after the temple's destruction until the coming coronation of Jesus as King of Israel, ruler of a world kingdom on planet earth, and also the eternal heavenly kingdom. That's what the revelation of Jesus, the book of Revelation is all about. Jesus asked John to write it down in a book. John did, sent it to the seven churches. So we know that this prophecy is written to the post-apostolic church. God does not want us to be ignorant about what's gonna happen. But I will also tell you, the book of Revelation is written in a mysterious symbolic language. Why? Because God wants to hide this prophecy from the devil himself. <laughs> That's the only reason I can figure that out that that's what God is up to, why it is so mysterious. So Jesus is depicted in this prophecy with the seven stars in his right hand. That's found in Revelation 1, 16, and also in verse 20. And here we'll see Domitian, there's a statue of him, okay? And uh, over here is a coin of Domitian with the, in this case, he's got six stars, he's sitting on the globe, if you wanna see that. So that was a common way to depict him. So why would Jesus appear in this prophecy with seven stars? He wanted everybody to know that he's the real king, that there is no divine Caesar. Jesus is the divine son. He's the one who rules the world. He has the seven stars. 
Of course, you'll see if you count these, there's only six stars here on Domitian's coin. So these disappear in Revelation, and this appears. Jesus stands among the lampstands, the seven churches. He's got seven stars in his hands. Uh, the, the church is getting the broadcast here that Jesus is the real Domitian. He's the real emperor, and that's why that, that picture is there. So Jesus' revelation, let's keep talking about it. Now, there's a blessing for those who study this prophecy. Uh, you need to study to show yourself approved, the Bible says. And there's a blessing. There's a blessing for the person who hears, reads, and keeps the words of the book of Revelation. And, and Jesus tells John that time is at hand. And he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify about these things to the churches. He says this in Revelation 1 and also in 22, 16. That's the blessing. Now, I believe that this angel is most likely the same angel that God sent to Daniel, okay? And uh, we can talk about that some other time. So what is the cursing on those who corrupt this prophecy, okay? If you change this prophecy and try to make it say something it doesn't, Jesus says, I testify to every man that hears the words of this prophecy. If you add to these words, you will reap the plagues written within the prophecy. If you take away the words from it, your name will be removed from the book of life. You will have no admittance to the holy city, New Jerusalem. This is, this is a warning to the church that we should not violate anything that's in this prophecy, especially betraying one another as we see the day approaching uh, for any reason. Let's stay together, shall we? So the blessing is the church history gets the signs in advance of what's going to happen. That's a blessing. You need to read them in order to know what the signs are, right? And in this next series of Bible studies, we're going to talk about that. The cursing is, do not change this important prophecy and don't violate the contents of it. Keep it. Okay, that's why this word is here. Keep the words of this prophecy. That's what this revelation is all about. So, we're going to continue talking about it. What is the time frame of the prophecy? Okay, and the time frame, Jesus says, is at hand. He said, write these things you see that are and the things that shall be. So, we know that this prophecy is twofold, things that existed during the time of John and Domitian and the things that shall be in the post-apostolic church age. So who was this prophecy written for? We already talked about that, the seven churches of the post-apostolic age. And when was this prophecy written? Now, this is the key question. I'm going to answer why this is important, okay? This prophecy was written in AD 95, near the end of Domitian's reign. How do we know this? Irenaeus and other Christian writers of that time have told us that. You see, the people that believe in preterism, okay, preterism is a doctrine that says all these things have already occurred with the end of the reign of Nero, and Nero's reign ended in AD 68 with the beheading of Paul and possibly Peter, and they say that's when all these prophecies were, were concluded. Well, that's a problem because we have a record that this was written in AD 95, which tells us that preterism is a bad doctrine. It's an error in hermeneutics. It's been proven false so many times. If you run into anybody who's trying to preach this to you, uh, send me an email. I'll get you straightened out. So this came from Patmos, the, uh, the penal colony of Rome, and it was an exporter of marble. It's very much possible that John was mining or, or consigned to a mine where they were mining marble. A lot of people say salt, but that's not the case. There's no salt mine there. And uh, we're going to take a look at this island right now. There's, Pat, there's Patmos, and it's uh, 60 miles from Ephesus and 37 miles from Miletus. Remember, Paul met with the leaders of the Ephesus church at Miletus, etc., to warn them that a wolf would come into their church. And, of course, we believe that wolf was Justin Martyr in around 136 A.D. And we go on. What did Justin Martyr do? He introduced philosophy, Greek philosophy, to the Jewish roots of the church. The hen and the chick sign. Let's talk about that. Jesus, of course, in Matthew 23, says this in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. I'm going to stop right there. The hen would gather her chicks. This was a common phrase that was used to talk about the Pleiades constellation. So if you were a person that was alive at that time, like in Ephesus or in Asia Minor, when you saw that phrase, you would have immediately thought about the Pleiades star con constellation uh, in, the, uh, in the sky. Okay, and then he adds to this uh, prophecy here. He says, see your house. He's talking about the temple is left you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
So we know that this prophecy in Matthew uh, 23 through 24, Luke 21, is about the destruction of the temple and also the coronation of Jesus, that time frame. And that's really the time frame of the book of Revelation as well. So the coronation pledge by the priests was supposed to be to the loyalty to the King Messiah of Israel. Jesus was their anointed king, the anointed one. There's only one Messiah. And of course, Jesus in Matthew 24 warns them about many false messiahs will arise in the church age. So Psalm 118, if you want to know about the coronation uh, Psalm, here it is. You can read the whole Psalm yourself, but I just picked out two of the verses. One in the beginning that says, let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house, the temple of the Lord. And that's the hen and chicks prophecy. Here you'll see the Pleiades constellation at seven stars. It is a mirror reflection of the seven churches of Asia. Okay. This looks kind of like a fish hook. And uh, you can see the seven churches of Asia from Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those are paralleled by the Pleiades constellation. Here it is. This constellation was called the seven sisters, uh, but the seventh sister was missing. In other words, this last star, think of it as Laodicea, became missing. It used to shine somewhere in here, and then it became dark. That's a variable star. There are stars that will shine for a period of time, and then they'll go dark. There was a star in the Pleiades constellation, the seventh sister, that went dark. Okay. And then it's also called the hen and the chicks. And here you'll see six chicks. Okay, the seventh chick is missing. They knew this about Pleiades, that, that in the olden days, uh, prior to Christ, there was another star shining here, but it's been missing. Okay, and there we see it appearing again. And we see it appearing again over here. Will this, this is my question, will this be the sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Will this star shine and all of a sudden erupt? Now, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, they have a, a, a uh, they have a, the Kepler spacecraft is watching this constellation constantly and they publish all kinds of data about it. Uh, these stars are actually spinning. Uh, every 11 days, these stars rotate, do a complete rotation, just like our own sun does it every, I believe it's 26 days. So if this shows up, then we know that that's the sign of Jesus' coming, just like the star of Bethlehem was the sign of his first coming. There will be a star that will be visible. Every eye shall see it of Jesus' second arrival. At least that's my opinion. Uh, people in the Vatican seem to think so because they've got a couple of uh, telescopes, one down in South America, one here in Europe, to watch the skies for the sign of Jesus' second coming. So the conflagration, the two-stage rapture. What does the word conflagration mean? So I'm going to read the scripture first. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. In fact, other translations say that the sins of the earth will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness, godliness, waiting for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved? There's your definition of conflagration. A fire that dissolves and purifies and it's wrath, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. So conflagration, that word means a burning fire of purification and wrath. God always purges the old before he comes in with the new. This happened during the time of Noah's flood. He destroyed the, the blood drinkers, the blood eaters, the, the violent ones. And then, of course, Noah and his family uh, survived, the preacher of righteousness. God always purges, but he promised never to purge the earth again by water. This time it will be by fire, as Peter has told us in 2 Peter 3.10. This is called the conflagration. But then is, something's going to occur, a two-stage rapture of the church. So let's talk about that for a second. So there's going to be a second sign of the Son of Man. It's going to appear in the heavens. Most likely, I believe, it will be a star, much like the Bethlehem star, signaling that his first arrival. Every eye shall see it. Okay. Now Jesus is then going to manifest in the sky. So we're looking for this sign. He told us there'll be a sign. Jesus is going to manifest in the sky. This is going to cause the graves to be opened and the dead in Christ will rise first in the sky, not on earth. Jesus does not put his feet on the Mount of Olives until the second, uh, until the marriage supper of the Lamb is over with. He rescues Israel. Now, this, this idea here of the dead in Christ rising first is very important. Let's, let's talk about that. Romans 6.3 says this, 
Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? If you've been baptized in the name of Jesus, you are dead in Christ because you're baptized into his death. To be dead in Christ is to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38. Memorize it. Tattoo it on your refrigerator. Acts 2.38. This is how you're buried with him in baptism. Galatians 3.27 echoes it, confirms it, for as many of you that were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So it's not only a death baptism. This is the watery grave. We become dead in Christ when we begin to live for him and not to our own will. So, the people that are dead in Christ, that are in the graves, will be open. They'll go first. Then those of us which are alive, if we're still alive and we're dead in Christ, isn't that kind of an oxymoron there? That's sort of like uh, 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 sort of an opposite thing. We're alive, but we're dead in Christ. That means people that are alive and living on the planet at the time that Jesus appears in the sky, after the, the graves are opened and people are raptured, then those that are alive will be caught up into the sky and join the other people that are dead in Christ. Now, the world is going to recognize this, and when they recognize it, they know that the time is very, very short. They will mourn, they will hide themselves in the caves, the elites will go to their islands, they'll go to New Zealand, hide in the jungle, won't do any good because of the conflagration. God is going to send the fire. So the conflagration of Armageddon rages while we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is a wedding feast. And of course, the question is, who is worthy to stand before the Son of Man? That's the question of uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So this rapture is begun by a twinkling. That's kind of related to the twinkle, twinkle little star. The twinkling of the eye. Do you get it? There will be a last trumpet call. It will be concluded by the transformation of water into wine. This is a parallel to the marriage supper or the wedding feast at Canaan. When we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb, our water is going to be turned to wine. There's going to be a complete transformation of us. We will lose all of that flesh that is susceptible to sin. The law of sin will be eradicated from us. And at that time, our water will be turned into wine. Our Holy Ghost will become total and uh, not just a down payment, uh, a measure. He's going to give us a full dose of the Holy Ghost. Our water will be turned to wine. That's what the wedding feast of Cana was all about. It was the first miracle. It'll be the miracle that Jesus does for his church at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the day of the Lord, the conflagration, it's found in the Old Testament right here in Isaiah 13, 9 through 13. And Isaiah says, Behold, the cruel day of the Lord is coming with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners that are up out of it for the stars of heaven and the constellations shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its position and the moon shall not allow its light to shine. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the elites. I will make a man more precious than fine gold. And then it goes on to say, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of its place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his first fierce anger. Now, whether this is going to be a destruction of one fourth of the world, like uh, Islam has prophesied to do, uh, many people think that the earth will be whittled down to about a 10% of its population through this conflagration, whether this is, has to do with uh, just with sin or there is a cataclysmic uh, uh, destruction by nature. We're not sure, but we see this prophecy here and it sure seems to be pretty otherworldly to me. I mean, will it be uh, comets and asteroids hitting the planet and doing all the things that they can do? We, we just don't know, but we, we want to be able to avoid this, okay? And uh, we have to be faithful to each other and to Jesus Christ. So what's the sign of the conflagration? Okay. And uh, this is a very, very fascinating subject. And in this prophecy here, Isaiah 13, the Bible says that God will stir up Iran and Iraq, which represent the Shiite nations. Okay. Iran and Iraq. Well, we're not quite finished. Um, I got a couple more things I wanted to point out. One is a quick video with a little bit of uh, overdubbing by me and a couple slides that uh, really should let you know what hour we're living in. Let's begin with the video, shall we? What you are witnessing is the celebration by the soldiers of Baghdad trained by the United States who are Shiite Muslims. The battle with Mosul is the old ancient village of Nineveh. Mosul is predominantly a Sunni city and the Sunnis 
have been liberated from ISIL, which is a Sunni terrorist group. Now the people of Mosul are worried that these Shia soldiers will turn on them, much like Saddam Hussein, who was a Ba'athist Sunni, turned on the Shia people. This is a sectarian war. The United States is backing anybody who will fight ISIS, whether they be Shia in Iran or the Sunni Kurds in Raqqa. This is eventually going to turn to Israel's demise as they move into Lebanon further. Well, this appears to be a great victory for uh, Donald Trump. He'll, he'll declare victory over ISIS. Uh, but the real issue is, is that this is simply a domination of the green horse riding, Shia Islam. And that's really what's going on. The United States will support anybody who will go against uh, Sunni uh, ISIS. Um, and they're the old Ba'athists that were defeated by George Bush in the first uh, and second Iraq wars. And now they're riding on towards Lebanon. The Iranian soldiers are mixed in with the Iraqi Shia soldiers. And of course, the people of Mosul are very concerned about uh, what's going on. We know that in Revelation 6, 1 through 8, that Islam is the prophesied end time force that uh, takes the world to death and to hell, one quarter of the world. And so we know that when the conflagration uh, comes, it looks like it's going to affect one fourth of the world. Here's the Sunni nations, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Sudan, ISIS, Pakistan, Indonesia, Kuwait, Afghanistan, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco. Here's the Shia nations, Iran, Iraq, Bahrain, Azerbaijan, Hezbollah, and Lebanon, they are Shias. The Shias are riding. That's what it says in Revelation 6, 1 through 8. And uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that these are the four colors of every Islamic flag. The flag of the Arab revolt has these four colors in it. And uh, we see that uh, one-fourth of the world uh, is going to be uh, uh, taken over by these people. And here we see the, uh, the rest of the scripture. You can read this on your own. I encourage you to do it. Uh, this is the bottom line here, is that you can see Shia Iran uh, and the Shiites. Qatar is uh, funding some of this. They're moving towards Israel. This is the Shia Crescent. This is the green horse riding. Of course, all four colors of the Islamic flag, red, green, black, and white are involved. Uh, this is the end time force. This is a conflagration uh, and uh, we need to be aware of it. And uh, of course, Muhammad's horse was Al Barak. Uh, and of course, the sword, the uh, scimitar, the horse is always a symbol of Islam. Here you see the four horsemen, the apocalypse riding. They're the same four colors of the flag of the Arab revolt. And here you see the uh, Shia uh, I guess you'd call him a sage. Uh, and Turkey, of course, is red. There are Sunnis. There's the real war that's going to happen. The Sunnis over here in Turkey, they're red. Over here is the Shias, they're green. We've got a big problem on our hands, folks. It's time to get busy for Jesus Christ.